Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our September webinar uh, for Catch the Next. We are honored to have um, a, a renowned author and Tejano um, who will be reading from his book and um, one that we think will be of much interest to the colleges, um, to folks who just are interested in Tejano literature and whatnot. So it is my honor to introduce uh, Mr. Silvia, uh, Silvia, my goodness, I'm sorry, Sergio Troncoso. I don't know why I said Silvia. That's um, okay. <laughs> That's my uh, alter ego. There you go. <laughs> uh, Mr. Troncoso is most recently the author of Nobody's Pilgrims, which won the gold medal for best novel, adventure or drama in English from the International Latino Book Awards. He also wrote A Peculiar Kind of an Immigrant Son, which Luis Alberto Uria praised as a world-class collection. Troncoso edited Nap Pantla Familias, an anthology of Mexican-American literature on families in between worlds, which received a star review from Kirkus Reviews. He's also a Fulbright Scholar and a past president of the Texas Institute of Letters. And Mr. Troncoso also teaches at the Yale Writers Workshop. So um, without much ado, I will hand it over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Aaron, and and thank you everybody for uh, for being here, especially Anna. Um, very very thrilled to talk to Catch the Next and to administrators, teachers, and students. You know, whoever finds this video, you know, I think the most important thing to know about me is that I really grew up on the border, and I never, you know, I grew up in Isleta, which is uh, right outside of El Paso, a very rural sort of area, or at least it was very rural when I was growing up. And um, and so this novel that I wrote, is in a, it all begins in Isleta. And I want to talk to you about the novel. And then I want to read a little bit about the novel. And then if people want to have some sort of conversation or, or questions about it, um, it I, I believe first it's a perfect novel for community college students. Um, it's all the three protagonists, uh, Duri in the middle of the, of the picture, and Arnulfo on the right, and then Molly on the left, they're all 17-year-old protagonists. And they, uh, Turi and Arnulfo meet in Isleta, and Arnulfo is an undocumented immigrant, and Turi is a, a Mexican-American from Isleta. And so they meet in a, a chicken farm where they're carrying chickens from trucks. And um, on, a, on a lark, you know, Basically, Turi decides to join Arnulfo, who tells him one day that I'm about to get a ride to Kansas City and, and get out of the border because Arnulfo, of course, doesn't want to get caught by La Migra. And so as they start their journey with Juanito, who is a foreman at this chicken farm, they suddenly realize that um, Juanito is carrying some sort of contraband in the truck because he gives money to an immigration officer at the checkpoint near Lubbock. And so that that sort of begins the story. That's the very beginning of the story. And what they decide to do have tremendous consequences and starts this very fast paced, very exciting novel. Um, they decide to get rid of Juanito at a rest stop, steal the truck. And so that takes uh, Turi and Arnulfo on this road trip. And, and what happens uh, as they do this is that uh, they later meet Molly, who is um, in, in the Mark Twain National Forest near, near Steelville, Missouri. Molly is this working class white girl who, who they meet in a tiny little town of 2,000 people or so. And so the, all three of them end up going across country, searching for their American dreams. And you know, looking for hope in the in the U.S. while evil people are after the contraband hidden in the truck. So, so these teenagers go through, um, you know, they go through a lot, and that that was in many ways. And I don't, I don't want to reveal anything that actually happens to the to the novel, but but they go through a lot for a reason. Because I think one of the things I was trying to do in the novel is to communicate the community that these three outsiders build amongst themselves. 
even when other people don't want them. Duri is not really wanted by his family, which is one of the reasons he leaves. Arnulfo is uh, an undocumented immigrant and really being hunted in this in this country for simply wanting to work and send money back to his family in Chihuahua. And Molly is an orphan, just like Turi is. And um, she's not really wanted in her household either because her her brother is sort of a racist and, and very right wing. And Molly's not like that. And so she she doesn't feel like she belongs in the family that she is at. And so so the, the, the whole novel is really about the, the community that they form through the dangers that happen through them, through people coming after them, to uh, sometimes Arnulfo saves uh, the other two from a dangerous situation, and sometimes it's Molly, and sometimes it's Duty. And it is this sort of bond that they create over time as, as some very sort of colorful characters readers have written to me and told me you know your your evil people are so exciting too um but there, there's like a guy named um el hijo de huerta who i call like the babe ruth of narcos and he's coming after them uh after the truck and he's like the terminator he will not stop until he finds this truck that these kids stole and 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 get back what what's very valuable to, to the narcos pursuing these kids. Um, and so, and the, the other, you know, there's another guy named um, Don Ilan from Acapulco, who's sort of the head narco. And then uh, his counterpart, John Bradas Dunbar, who is the distributor of the drugs and, and other things that they're passing to the border in, in Texas. And one of the reasons, by the way, people ask me this all the time, why did I make this uh, John Broaddus Dunbar the way he was? Um, and it was to, it was for a point because so many people who benefit from the drug trade on this side of the border are blonde and blue eyed and and um, you know part of the uh, part of the elite really in, in along the border. And John Broaddus Dunbar, his ancestors went to the Alamo and. You know, he either on the front is a very respectable business uh, man, but behind the scenes, he's actually doing some very awful, dirty stuff. And so, so this was sort of a point to, to try to get that connection. And and I think one of the other things to think about, especially if if you're appealing to a, a a community college audience and students, is that reading and and literature and storytelling play a really big role in this novel. Duty loves to read. He's a bookworm. He's this poor kid who in the when he gets into the truck with Arnulfo, uh, he's carrying five or six books that Mrs. Garcia from the Isleta library uh, gave to him for the summer. And one of them, of course, is, is Mark Twain, The Adventure of Huckleberry Finn. And so Duty loves to read. And that that is in itself what propels him to start once they steal the truck and they get the truck away from Juanito and that starts the whole uh, novel rolling um, and they decide to go to Connecticut, it's all through imagination. It is because of what Tudi has read about Connecticut and New England and the differences between those places very far away, which he does not know. He only knows them through books. But the imagination that is spurred um, through reading and how it causes him to to change and to um, to make decisions about his life that that he wants a different uh, you know a different start. Um, so and that's one thing. And another thing is Molly when they meet Molly in in, in Missouri and, and Molly decides to join them. One of the ways Tudi and Molly starts connecting with each other is through the love of words and reading. Molly is also loves to read. Molly, you know, Tudi starts showing Molly Spanish, and Molly starts teaching Tudi, you know, Missouri idioms, and so this is how they start connecting to each other. This is how they start seeing each other beyond the facade of of what they face. For example, you know, Molly had never met a Mexican or or really been very exposed to Mexicano, and 
And once she starts engaging Tootie in these word games and storytelling, she starts seeing, you know, this is one of the smartest kids I've ever met. This is a, a guy who's, uh, you know, very thoughtful. And the same thing with Molly, I, you know, for Tootie. From Tootie's point of view, he's intimidated by women. You know, he's, he's, he's 17 years old. He's never really, you know, in Isleta, at Isleta High School where he went. I think there were only a handful of people who were blonde. Uh, it was mostly a, a border high school. Over 90% of the kids were Mexicanos or Mexican-American. And so so he he doesn't know what to do, you know, when they start talking with Molly, that is there's this, this working class white girl who looks like one of the rich kids in El Paso, but she's not. She's actually as poor as he is, but she loves reading. And so so he also has to go beyond his stereotypes and what he thinks um, you know, Molly might be just as much as Molly does. And, and it, it all begins through their love of language and reading, which you see in this road trip as it happens uh, over time. And so anyway, so I'm going to read this piece. Um, and then if, you know, if Aaron or, you know, or Anna or, or somebody wants to ask me a question, I'm happy to answer. I'm going to read this piece that's sort of in the middle of the novel. And it's where they 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 they're going to Connecticut, but because Tootie wants to see the leaves, he wants to see he he loved Charlie Brown, he loves these um, specials, Charlie Brown specials where people are playing in leaves, and and it's very different from the border, from the 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 desert of the of the Chihuahua Desert in El Paso, and um, so they head to Connecticut simply on this idea from reading, and they ended up at a Danbury McDonald's just because they're, they're they're exhausted from driving and they know these people are after them. And so at this McDonald's, something important happens. And it's not crucial to the plot of the novel, but it is crucial to seeing the different characters and how they look at the world because they all face very different dangers because of who they are. And so, so this is the sort of the section I'm going to read. Um, they arrive at this McDonald's. And um, Molly has gone over to a couple that is also in the McDonald's. And um, they see that they're reading a, a magazine called Yankee Magazine, which is all about New England. And, and the couple gives them, gives them the magazine. It has pictures of places to go in Connecticut. And so he, she brings back this magazine that the couple has given her to Turi and Arnulfo to get ideas about like, where, where are we going to go? Now that we're in Connecticut, like, what are we going to do? What, what are we looking for? And so, so this is what happens. Duty picks up the magazine and reads the cover article from last year. The best towns for fall foliage. It focuses on a place called the Litchfield Hills and towns with names like New Milford, Kent, Cornwall, Warren, Washington Depot, Goshen. A magazine is going to tell us where to go? You have any better idea, Nulfo? This is actually pretty good. Look at these pictures. Wow. Reminds me of the book Mrs. Garcia showed me. Molly, gosh, thank you. La Molly Milagrosa. They're a very nice couple. Oh, here they come, Molly says. The man jams a baseball bat on his head as he wends his big body to the table and chairs. You all from Missouri, too? The man says, his wife standing behind him to one side. His temples are gray, and wiry gray hairs protrude from his hat. A pouty, harumph-like frown rests between his rosy cheeks. Mike, let's go. He ignores his wife behind him, staring intently at the two teenage boys, waiting for an answer. We're from Texas, Duty says, forcing a smile, trying to douse the blue fire he sees in the man's eyes. What part of Texas? Him too? The man looms over the table, taking a step toward them. El Paso. We're both from El Paso. Turi has stopped smiling and looks blankly at Molly in front of him, trying to gauge what she is thinking, and at Arnulfo, whose eyes seem cold and knowing. Bet you are. That's basically in Mexico, isn't it? Why don't you boys go back to where you came from? Excuse me? Molly says sharply. Puzzled shock blooms across Duty's face. He leans back again 
against the hard plastic seat as if absorbing an invisible blow. Adnulfo's leg suddenly stops pumping underneath the table. Missy, if I knew you'd be giving them the magazine, if I knew you were with them, I would have kept it. Stay with your own, goddammit. Before anyone can open their mouth, before anyone can respond, the man and the woman march toward the glass doors, which swing shut behind them a second later. Tutti watches the older couple lower themselves awkwardly into a metallic gray sedan, not saying a word to each other, while Molly stares at Tutti and Arnulfo, who scan the restaurant again, empty except for a few people in the food line. Nobody has turned to look at them. Nobody is paying them any mind. Tutti thinks about the sound of his voice in English in Connecticut, that stilted border accent he never realized he had in El Paso. The dark caramel complexion of his skin when compared to Molly's glowing light tan and to the faces of the other diners. Tutti examines Arnulfo, who looks like a brawny Tarumara Indian compared to him. Tutti remembers the strange feeling repeated throughout his life. Who he thinks he is in his mind is sometimes not who others see or imagine he can be. This gap never seems to go away. Sometimes this secret self is comforting for its privacy. Sometimes it's amusing when he witnesses what crazy assumptions others have of him. Too often this gap is dispiriting, a prison inside of him without any means of escape. Stupid fat idiot. I should have said something. I'm sorry. Molly, come on. It's not your fault. How would you know what he was going to do? It is her fault, Ese. She went to talk to them. She's not Mexican. She doesn't understand. What the hell does that mean? Duty glares at Arnulfo and for the first time during the trip wishes Nulfo were not with them. Molly glances between Turi and Arnulfo nervously. She doesn't know what it's like, how people see us, especially los güeros. Maybe not all of them, but enough. Enough to make it dangerous for us. You think it's better to hide, Nulfo? Not say anything? Not try anything? Turi says, not wanting to stop this argument, both forearms on the table, glaring at the squat Arnulfo in front of him, as if ready to pounce on him. Yes, for me, it's better for me. Guys, let's... Molly, wait. This is important. Nulfo, it's not better. Because you're an Americano, Turi. That's why you think that way. You don't care if you attract attention or get into a fight. You don't have too much to lose. I do. Imagine the cops. The cops? Who's calling the cops, by the way? And you think the police are going to treat me better because I'm brown but American? That guy was just a racist asshole, Molly says to both of them. Silence. Arnulfo looks out the window. The couple has indeed driven away. Their blue truck is still there. I don't even want to look at that stupid magazine anymore, Molly says quickly into the silence. Who the hell does he think he is? I disagree, Molly Milagrosa. I definitely disagree. He gave us the magazine. That piece of paper didn't do anything to us. I still like the photographs, and I want to drive around this Litchfield. I'm not sure everyone around here is like that. Let's get out of here and go north on Route 7. Finally, vámonos, pinche gringo, Arnulfo says, staring at Molly, sliding to the edge of the plastic booth bench. Hey, that's like stupid white guy, right? What a jerk. Let's get out of here, Arnulfo stares at the magazine between them as if it were a tarantula crawling on the table. Who's driving? Molly asks. I just drove for four hours away, Arnulfo says, turning to Tutti and ignoring Molly. I'll drive. It's my Connecticut we're looking for, right? Tutti grabs Yankee magazine as he stands up. And I'm going to flip a little forward to the end of the chapter. They keep driving north. What strikes duty is how the Housatonic River just before Connecticut switches from right to their left, or rather how they have almost imperceptibly traveled over a short bridge disguised as an innocuous overpass. What strikes him, too, are the dramatic green hills on one side of the river in Kent, a backdrop 
that seems to hold this hamlet in place and give it focus. The grassy fields leads to more hills on the opposite horizon. The sudden shift in perspective, this frame of hills and river, all of it urges him to stop, to look around, to absorb the panorama. After reaching the one stoplight town, Tutti turns into a parking lot, follow, following an SUV in front of him, and stops behind the few small stores in what looks like the center of town. The trio walk up and down Main Street on Route 7, which splits the town of Kent in two. The most popular place for lunch, it seems, is the diner called the Colonial Settler, with big red umbrellas right on Main Street. Studi's stomach grumbles. He notices, too, one of the waiters serving customers outside is a stocky, muscled, dark-skinned man with a crew cut. A Mexican in Connecticut? Maybe Tutti can talk to him and learn about this place called Kent. As soon as they sit down inside the diner, Tutti notices the papel picado crisscrossing the walls, colorful cut paper with elaborate designs, Mexican folk art. He reads a small stand-up menu on their table announcing Mexican night on Wednesdays. The people behind the counter, the cooks flipping burgers and tending the omelets, all of them seem to be Mexicanos. All the customers are güeros, or Anglos, as they say in El Paso. But the people who run this place are Mexican. A few customers waiting to pay for their meals shake hands with a genial, mustachioed man in a black t-shirt, also short and sturdy like the waiter outside. Amid the lively cacophony and conversation, Tutti hears the name Rudy several times, but he isn't sure. Tutti tells Oscar the waiter Tutti first saw outside that they are from El Paso, that his parents are from Juarez. Arnulfo starts speaking Spanish with Oscar, and Molly can't stop grinning at both of them. That's when Rudy comes over and introduces himself. Oscar is Rudy's younger brother. Mimi, Rudy's wife, is behind the counter. His son and niece take turns at the cash register. His sister-in-law is a waitress, too. Miguel over there. You see him? He's our cook. Son de Juarez, Miguel. He's also Oaxaqueño. Rudy says, his eyes dancing with joy. Miguel waves at Tutti, holding a spatula up in the air. Rudy Fernandez, merry and somewhat of a punster, is the owner of the colonial settler. In a diner in that small town in the remote northwest corner of Connecticut, Tutti finally feels at home. Molly is in front of him with a smile that won't stop. Arnulfo relaxes for once. That is exactly the moment when Tutti decides he'll stay in Connecticut, in Kent. He isn't sure what he'll do or how he'll do it, but that is the clearest thought in his mind. Kent can be his new home. Not far behind is how to ask Molly to stay with him. And of course, what ends up, that's, that's the, the reading. And of course, what ends up happening is Molly and Tutti, um, you know, it's a love affair. And so they 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 start becoming a couple over time. So it's also about, you know, Tutti's evolution, I guess you could say, as a uh, as a man, you know, having sort of these dreams of what in in El Paso, what his what a what a girlfriend might be, uh, very sort of childish and sort of somewhat adolescent dreams to to kind of dreaming about Mrs. Garcia, the 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 kind of cute librarian who has given him books and fed him books all his life. And he, you know, she's married, but it's really just sort of a dream that Tutti has in his head to finally the real girlfriend that becomes his girlfriend, Molly, this, this woman he meets uh, in dangerous situations um, and, and befriends over time. And so, so it's a lot of it, by the way, a lot of the, the novel should be read going from idealism to realism like what what you think connecticut will be when you've never been and you grew up in isleta versus what the real connecticut will be when you arrive and you have to experience it and same thing with with Tudi's idea of women what he thinks a girlfriend will be in isleta when he's never had a girlfriend he's too intimidated to approach women to 
you know, his, his interactions with Mrs. Garcia, you know, how could he find somebody like that who loves books as well to finally the real person he has in front of him, Molly, and how he interacts and, and develops a relationship with her. So all, all of that sort of move from idealism to realism is being played out in many different levels in the novel. So anyway, I hope that's sort of a nice introduction into what's going on in the novel. Thank you. Uh, you know, something something that I hear throughout this, I know you mentioned that one of the books that Turi has is The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. and But I hear like a lot of parallels between uh, Nobody's Pilgrim and Huckleberry Finn in terms of uh, leaving, leaving a place where he's not wanted, leaving uh, a, a negative environment, this sort of like adventure right. that, that goes wrong along the way. So uh, is that is that some place where you were drawing your inspiration? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say two, two books is very different. Mark Twain, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, but also No Country for Old Men by mm -hmm. Cormac McCarthy. So it is really in many ways inspired by both books. You know, Duty, once he joins Arnulfo, he has to make decisions like, do I turn in Arnulfo because he's an undocumented immigrant? It would be very convenient, but he doesn't because it's his friend. So, so he faces, you know, much of how uh, Huck faced, you know, societal pressures to go against uh slavery and to turn in jim but but he won't why because jim is his friend jim is someone who he believes in and so that that is that sort of inspiration as well but it's also about how i believe very concretely that you're formed by your by your actions your character you know you, you would say in spanish your character is formed by by the trials you survive Sometimes by luck, and sometimes because you make the right decisions, and sometimes because other people help you, mm -hmm. like teachers. So, so this is why I put these three through very dangerous situations, mm -hmm. because in a dangerous situation, you have to act, and and some people don't act. For example, and and one of the things you see about Duty is he's very resourceful. He thinks out of the box. He uh, is also very curious. So no está cerrado. You know, his eyes and his empathy is not closed. And all of this allows him to find unusual solutions in very charged moments. And and I, I give this example when I when I talk to my students. Imagine we're all sitting here together in a library and the roof starts collapsing because the meteor hit it or or so, you know, whatever disaster or a tree fell down. Some people are going to piss in their pants. Some people are going to run and save themselves and to hell with everybody else, you know, the George Costanzas of the world. Mm -hmm. And other people are going to start helping other people. So, and this is a very old theme in, in, in things like Aristotle, in which character is determined when you're under the pressure cooker, when you have to act, and when you don't have to think too much, but your real self comes out you know who you would be and and repeatedly duty is is this is this young poor kid that many people will see oh no no tiene nada que enseñarme this this young poor kid doesn't have anything to teach me quite the, the reverse he's resourceful he thinks out of the box he's open-minded he looks for alliances and he's curious and he and all of this opens him up to solutions and bravery that he even is surprised by it as well. And, and, and the same thing for the other characters, Molly as well, and for Arnulfo. Um, they have their different you know, predisposition, but um, the adventures themselves cause them to, to, to have a reckoning with their character. Like, should I do this? Like, like Molly at a certain point says, I just found that, you know, she doesn't know they have contraband in the truck at a certain point. And and then they finally find out, she finds out because they tell her and she's at a crucial moment in that point. Does she abandon them or does she? And her brother is telling him over the phone, these guys are just, you know, they're Mexican assholes. 
They're going to get you killed. His brother's very racist. And she said, but that's not who they are. That's mm-hmm. not who I am experiencing. You know, Dudi's very smart. I'm not going to abandon them. And so she stays in the truck even after she knows uh, that these pe- evil people are after them. And the same thing with Arnulfo. He's also faced at a moment in which he can turn and run and abandon them, but he doesn't. He says, I'm going to to help them out, even though I could easily, more conveniently, turn tail and run. And so so for me, it's also about all of this, this bonding and character forming that these three 17-year-olds are going through as, as the evil things are happening uh, around them and evil people are after them. Uh, you know, and violent things are happening to them. Um, and so so for for me, and, and you know, your character is not formed unless there's real danger. You know what I mean? I can have a Disneyland version of, of danger, but unless there's danger, or at least I can show the reader there's some real danger happening to these kids, I, you you won't reveal who they are when they respond to the danger or when they collapse or when they, you know, or when one of them pulls the other two up when they want to give up, you know, when so many things have happened to them. And and one of them, either Molly or Turi or Anulfo, will not let the other two give up. And, and for me, it's also about youth. You know, when you get old and crappy like I am, you know, you you start, you stop trying to open yourself to friendships. And this is one of the things I admire. I have two boys that are similar ages of these of these characters. What I admire is how they open themselves to other people. People they just met on the street. And how, you know, young people do this. And I, I find that very uh, inspiring with young people. And it, it's dangerous, right? Like you, you open yourself to someone brand new and they might end up taking advantage of you. They might end up abusing you. They might end up robbing you. But this is the the good thing that young people do, and I think that that's why I think a community college audience would really uh, enjoy this this kind of novel because it really uh, is a uh, is about these inspiring young people who do not give up on their American dream despite all the awful things happening to them and the grit and perseverance that comes out in their characters as these things happen. And and how they become adults, you know, at the end of the novel. Mm-hmm. Um, so so for me, that's that that that's how you know the adventures of Huckleberry Finn and No Country for Old Men sort of inspired um, this novel and this um, you know and this these three characters. And there's an even interesting story about the title. I don't know if you want yeah, to ask no, me please. about the title. I... So uh, a few years ago, I was asked to give this very big lecture. Um, which is given in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. And it's a lecture that where you get paid many thousands of dollars, okay? And it's been around for over 100 years, or yeah, I think now over 100 years. And Ernest Hemingway gave this lecture. Uh, Juno Diaz gave mm-hmm. this lecture. Uh, very tippy-top writers gave it, and they asked me, I want you to give you this lecture. It's called the White Fund Lecture, and it's given in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And um, and so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll do it. And so you know the 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 months are coming up, and I'm I'm looking at Lawrence where the, where this lecture was created by, you know, I start understanding the history of the lecture, mm-hmm. and and Lawrence, Massachusetts, of, of course, is in the heart of New England, but Lawrence, Massachusetts, now is a very different New England city. It um it is now majority Latino. Major- Dominican, Central American, um, you know, um, you know, Venezuelano, etc. And the White Fund lecture was established by this guy named Judge Appleton White, who was a contemporary of 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 Henry David Thoreau, and um, and also um, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Mm-hmm. You know, these classic New England writers. Mm-hmm. And and Judge Appleton White is one of the persons who started the Salem Lyceum and also uh, other lyceums in New England. And if you don't know what a lyceum is, the lyceums were basically the first public library, the free public libraries in, in communities and towns. Uh, people would donate their libraries, like Thoreau or, or whoever, or Emerson, 
and uh, they would have public lectures in these little houses surrounded by books, and it was free. The whole point was that it was free to anybody in the town who wanted to come and hear a lecture about philosophy or literature or whatever, poetry. And, uh, and it was because these people believed public education should be free. They were sort of radicals, mm -hmm. you know, uh, at that time. So, so George Appleton White established the Salem Lyceum and he started this lecture, which was given at the Senate and called the White Fund Lecture. And um, and so I, I, as a good Harvard kid from the border, what did I do? I said, I'm going to find out more about Judge Appleton White, the guy who started the lecture, which I'm about to give, because I said, I'm going to center it around that. So I found in the Harvard libraries um, his memoir that I don't think anyone had taken out in probably 50 years. And this is Judge Appleton White's memoir of what it was like in the 1840s when he's establishing this lecture series and he's talking to Henry David Thoreau and, and, and Ralph Waldo Emerson. And one of the things I found in the memoir is really interesting. He starts complaining in his memoir. And of course, this is, this is what my lecture becomes when I go to Lawrence, Massachusetts. I said, look at, let's look at what this guy was thinking when he started this lecture that I'm giving. So one of the things Judge Appleton White is complaining about in the 1840s is uh, about this these um, New England elite um, who have this, who are basically the descendants of the pilgrims you know the generations that followed the Mayflower you know in the 1600s and he's saying these people in his memoir want to keep out the new English settlers coming in the 1840s and other immigrants from Europe, now that they have made it, you know, in New England, from you know, after the Mayflower, and he's saying, you know, how selfish you are, that you for you have forgotten how your great great grandparents came over to this country, so in a very hostile world, and had to fight for every inch and every penny that they earned. Uh, and died, you know, half the pilgrims died. And, and you know, in the first, uh, in the Mayflower, you know, that they ate themselves. Mm -hmm. It was cannibalism. Mm -hmm. They started to eat because they were literally starving to death. And and so, so of course, when you make it, what happens? You stop, start trying to close the door on the new immigrants coming in. And so this was what Appleton White was talking about. And of course, I said, I know this cycle. I know what happens, right? This is a cycle that's repeated over and over again. Back then in the 1840s, it was Appleton White, you know, criticizing his New England neighbors who had made it, whose great grandparents were the pilgrims, but they had forgotten all of that struggle. They, they've made it. They now have big houses. They want to keep the New English settlers from coming in. But of course, it, it happened to Jewish immigrants, right? It happened to uh, Italian immigrants, Irish immigrants. And now, of course, more recently, it's happening with um, Mexican immigrants and now the Venezuelan immigrants. Even some Mexicans, right, in mm -hmm. Texas who have made it, that say, no, 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 these Venezuelans are not like us. Let's keep them out, mm -hmm. right? And so, and, and so it's a cycle that repeats itself, that when people make it, even, you know, your, your most uh, downtrodden immigrant, you start looking at the world in a very different way, and then you start trying to close the door on whatever new immigrant is come, trying to come in. And, and I think I wanted to make that point with the novel, which is these are nobody's pilgrims. The, the Latin American immigrants coming over now, like Arnulfo and even Turi's family, they, they are going to experience what the pilgrims really experience. Mm -hmm. so they will understand what it is to fight for America in a way that the people who have made it here have forgotten that fight, mm -hmm. have forgotten that struggle, have forgotten that effort. And, and, I, and I think, you know, that's why um, I titled the, the novel Nobody's Pilgrims, because um, they don't belong with anybody. They only belong with themselves. But they will understand deeply, because they have to fight for their place, it's not it's not a privilege that they're, they're, they're given this place, uh, you know, because of, of where they're born. Um, 
they had to fight for their place. So they're going to understand what it means to be an American, really, in a very deep way that the people who are against them here in this country uh, will never appreciate. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that was my idea with the, you know, with the, um, with the title. But it came from that. Well, thank you. That's, I mean, that's just a nice little... Uh, I mean, a lesson about so many things, right? Because I know, I know when, um, you know, when I taught U.S. history classes at community colleges, it would always like blow students' minds when you talk about like, at one point in our country, like Irish immigrants were, were the lowest, you know, considered like the lowest social standing you could have was being Irish or Scottish Right. Um, and, and, and that the, these perceptions about immigrants, like you said, as, as there's sort of generational wealth that's, that's accumulated and things like that. And then other, other folks replace them, the Italians, you know, Slavic immigrants, right. um, uh, you know, in the 20th century, you know, like Cambodian and Vietnamese immigrants and then right. Latinos and, and exactly what you just said of, of even even thinking of sort of inter Latino xenophobia that right. that um that comes out um it is so interesting and 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 uh yeah you know just but, as but, we but speak it, about it, these it, issues having that critical eye toward it is crucial yeah and it's also about understand like you know what I'm saying is actually something very radical mm -hmm. is that what I'm saying is the new immigrants are the ones who will be the true Americans, mm -hmm. not the Americans who are actually born here because they're too privileged and too fat and happy that they don't really understand what it is to be an immigrant anymore. Mm -hmm. And and so to really understand the pilgrims, you have to begin with nothing, with scarcity, with not being wanted, with with fighting for every inch of your life to survive. And, and when you lose that, when you become too accustomed to I belong here, you, you've actually taken many steps away from the original struggle to create this country. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, so, uh, and, and so that's, that's what I was trying to, you know, which is sort of, it is sort of radical because it upsets people when they understand what I was trying to do. Um, but I think it, it's important to understand that, you know, when you have too much, it really separates you from that struggle that that was very fundamental to creating this country. Well, and and I think uh, to tie back to something else that you said earlier, uh, this if you're if you're thinking of it as this concept through the lens of the American dream, then then you know that. Um, like Turi and Arnulfo in particular, like they they have an idea of what that is, or that or they know that what they what they have in in Isleta is not is right. not what they want for themselves. That they're dreaming, uh, whether Turi through his books, like imagining right. something something better, and and um and so yeah, that sort of imaginary. Whereas with other with other characters in the book, I'm assuming that like, they're not necessarily thinking about an American dream. They're just, that's, that's perhaps a concept that the, the more established you are, the, you, you may lose sight of what that is or what that sort of idealism is to right. have. Right. Right. And, and the, the interesting thing, you know, with the connection to Molly is that, um, you know, is that in many ways, you know, these immigrants, have actually a, a stronger connection with poor white working class, mm -hmm. um, you know, in Appalachia or or wherever you find them, than they have with with anyone else because they, they're also outsiders. They're also not wanted. They're also ignored, um, you know, by by many people. And well, so, and also you're talking about two communities that have two kinds of communities that have been decimated by like cartels and drug trade and. Exactly. There's a lot of overlap there as well. Right. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I love outsiders because I was always an, an outsider, you know, in El Paso, as well as when I certainly went to Harvard and, and Yale. And, and it's, it's about, for me, you know, this novel and, and the work that I think I, I you know, that you'll see later, because I'm, I'm sort of working on a finishing a book of essays. It, it, it's about making this country 
into a place that can be my home. And then, and then you have to do it through some fights. You have to do it to making people open their minds when they don't want to open their minds or they don't want to read you because you have a funny name like Troncoso mm -hmm. uh, or whatever. And, or you're from El Paso and you have an accent and you're Mexican, you know, you grew up with, you know, without electricity, you know, you're not, you're not Mr. Upper West Side, New York, you know? And so, so you, it, it's also about that immigrants are changing this country. It's not just that the country is changing the immigrants. It's also the immigrants are, are changing the country, I think in a positive way. Um, and, and so, and so, and not a lot of people like that. Not a lot of people like that, you know, this country is becoming browner and, uh, but, but also Latinos, you know, and certainly Mexicans. You know, we have the highest intermarriage rate of any ethnicity. You know that. I did that's, not know that. That's been statistically true for many, many decades. We marry African-Americans. We marry Jews. We marry Irish. We marry Italian. We marry, you know, uh, you know, uh, I have an aunt who married a Chinese, a Chinese American uh, man, you know, and so, and of course, you know, it, it would make sense in many ways because, you know, Latinos and, and Mexicans, we're all of those, mm -hmm. you know, whether there's the slaves that were sent to Veracruz, uh, an ancient Jewish community in Mexico City. I don't know if you know knew that. I did know that. I studied you know, that I mean, through my uh, master's program. Yep. You know, Japoneses and, and, and Chinos in Chihuahua, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Mennonites in Chihuahua. I mean, and it's, we we assume there's some sort of uh, you know that that, that it's not this big mezcla this big mestizaje, but that's actually who we are and we've always been that way. But you know you unfortunately I think too many people are always looking for some sort of purity mm -hmm. um, in their lives. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. that they began somehow pure. There's not there's never been a pure starting point, uh, and and I think it's simply a. Uh, 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 you know, so, some sort of thing we torture ourselves with, um, and 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 use, unfortunately, to demean other people, to mm -hmm. attack each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I just recently took my my genealogy um, blood test, and you know what the my greatest proportion uh, What's that? Native American. I'm forty percent Native American. And, and and it's split between, uh, and I don't know, you know, I would I, I assume it, I had some sort of, a, um, you know, an uncle or aunt or, or great great grandparent really who was a, a maybe could be Apache, could be Navajo, mm -hmm. um, but 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 it's also split between Native American from Chihuahua, mm -hmm. and also it's about six percent, so a total of forty six percent. Native American from North America, from like Canada. Mm -hmm. And then there's a big dollop of Spanish, mm -hmm. Portuguese, even Irish, mm -hmm. um, all of that. And so, you know, I mean, I, it didn't really change my life, but, but it, it, for me, it's like I've been, I knew I was a mestizo, you know, for all of my life. I wasn't really trying to go back to some sort of pure beginning um, that never existed anyway, at least for me. Mm -hmm. yeah I mean I I have not taken mine my my brother did so I figured that was good enough and and ours you know I think that uh you know you spoke of spoke of the the Mexican Jewish population I mean ours ours came back with some some Spanish in it the family lore is that uh our our family was descended of descendants of the Spanish Jews who were kicked out of Spain uh -huh. in 1492 and ended up in Mexico. So well, I'll tell you, you know, because you know my wife is Jewish. Oh, I did not know. Yeah, my wife is Jewish. And my by the way, my sister's Muslim. Okay. I don't know if you know that. So I, I I'm know. as I tell people, uh, I would be the perfect mayor of Jerusalem. Yeah. You know, my parents are Mexican Christian Catholics and my 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 wife is Jewish and my sister is Muslim. She converted, became a Chicana Muslim. Okay. But 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 I I wrote uh, some pieces for a long time ago to impress my mother in law basically that I was a real writer. Uh, I wrote 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 to Hadassah magazine, 
um, which is a big Jewish women's yeah. magazine. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, they, they pay actually really well. And so I, I wrote one, one of the things, and they put me on the cover, a Latino in a Jewish world. Oh. That was one of them. Oh, neat. And um, yeah, and it's in the, they're in crossing borders, personal essays. Okay. And and so when these articles came out, this guy named uh, Richard Troncoso wrote to me and he said, mm-hmm. oh, I saw your articles in Hadassah magazine. You might be really interested in in all this genealogy uh, that that, you know, that you started to explore. Uh, and I, by the way, in the article that I wrote for Hadassah, I actually wrote about how my grandmother, my abuelita, who was a viista in Chihuahua, how she taught me to appreciate um, the righteousness that I would always, that I often would see in the Jewish community, and, and certainly in my wife's family, uh, because my my abuelita was a you know tough as nails older woman who just did not like to see anybody be abused, mm-hmm. and she would go right at you if you if you did something terrible so for me her her voice is always in my head like am i screwing up what would my abuelita say at this point in my life but but so so richard troncoso this oracle systems engineer had spent a lot of money traveling to madrid and to the catholic archives in in rome um researching our name Mm -hmm. but what did he find out uh troncoso is listed among Sephardic Jews kicked out by Ferdinand and Isabella, yep. um, Jews from Toledo in 1492. And then, uh, so apparently I do have a little bit of Jewish ancestry, uh, but if you want to explore your own ancestry from Spain, um, there's a, a great book called by Pierre Bonin, B-O-N-I-M. Okay. I think it's called Sangre Judía. Okay. And- and it was published in Spain, and it's now gone to 15 or 20 printings. And in it, he tries to trace as many, and he's a, he's a very well-known, you know, uh, Spanish journalist, the Spanish, the Jewish ancestry of many Spanish families. Mm-hmm. And, and in, in Sangre Judía, which I was able to finally get a copy of uh, a few years ago, it lists Troncoso as, as Jews from Toledo. Uh, you know, kicked out from by Ferdinand and Isabella to the New World, but it it goes by names and and where they're from and and he does all this research to try to to discover these Sephardic families. Oh, fascinating, fascinating. But all of us probably have a little bit of that. Probably, I mean, for those who are interested, I know that there was a book that came out a few years back called Kugel and Frijoles on oh, okay. on Latino Jews in the U.S. So, um, there's that. Well. In the interest of time, we're coming up at four. I didn't. I don't want to take uh, uh, any more of your time, but I do want to let folks who who find their way to this video later know that um, Sergio has graciously shared a teacher's guide with us. So we do have a companion um, aid to go with Nobody's Pilgrims for anyone who is interested in adopting this book for their courses. Um, I, I hope that this uh, this talk will be very useful to folks who are thinking about um, the text that they incorporate into their classes, the sort of rich themes that they can talk about that cut across all sorts of, of groups and identities and, and um, ages and, and things like that. And so, um, Sergio, I want to thank you very, very much for your time and uh, for the reading and, and for introducing uh, this book to us. Uh, I I have already downloaded it, so I will be diving into it because uh, I oh. want to know. I want to know the the adventures of Turi and Arnulfo. Oh, and and, yeah. I mean, I think the last thing I'll say very briefly. Thank you so much, and and catch the next for inviting me here, you know, to be with you. But if any teacher wants to use my book and they want to, you know, arrange a a Zoom call with me to talk to students and answer questions, I am happy to do that. You know, I do that all the time. I, you know, it doesn't cost anybody a penny, and I, I, I get on Zoom and and I will talk to you, and talk to your class. And um, and the other thing is, the book is really an exciting read. I, you know, I made it like a thriller, so it's it's meant to entertain, but also to open up all these questions, deep questions about our identity, where we belong, how we belong, who are our friends and who are our enemies, and how we determine all of that. You know, through a, a you know, to our adventures in life. 
Well, thank you so much. And uh, I will make sure that folks know that um, they can they can uh, get in contact with you. I'm happy to facilitate that for any of our partnering colleges so that, um, you know, we can we can um, help help foster a love of reading in our students and and um you know get get latino authors read in our colleges so absolutely i would love that all right well thank you so much sergio have a wonderful day and um yeah thank you for the support okay take care you too Bye bye, bye.